It's the Adam Ragusea Podcast, Episode 9, and today we are doing... Ask Adam! First question, it's our first audio question. Let us listen. Hi, Adam. Is all your bread broken, or am I constantly eating moldy bread? My name is Moritz. I just watched your video on sandwich bread, and I'm completely confused, so forgive me if this is a little bit long. Uh, I grew up on German sourdough, literally. Hofwisterei München is one of the oldest and most successful organic bakeries in Germany, and their most popular bread, Fister Sonne, was an absolute staple growing up. It has five ingredients, rye, wheat, sunflower seeds, salt and water. No added yeast, just sourdough. And we bought it by the half loaf and we always, always, always had one going. It was absolutely the most critical import of our family economy. Because during those times when my dad was away in business and my mom was busy, it was the base for two out of three of my meals and I would mow through that kilo of carbs in about two and a half days, all by myself. But it would also last a week before it got too stale to eat and as long as you could still cut it up, it would always toast. I've only ever seen it moldy when we forgot to empty the bread basket before a family holiday, so maybe after three weeks? I now make a version of that bread myself most weekends and I keep it out in the open, cut side down on its own board, it stays fresh for just as long and what we don't finish during the week I dry out completely, process into crumbs and add it back into my next dough. It basically never goes moldy. So long story short, what the heck is wrong with your bread, dude? Uh, rock hard after a day? Moldy after three to five? That's not bread. Am I crazy? Am I constantly eating stale, moldy bread without noticing it? Or is all bread just broken beyond belief in your country? If it is broken beyond belief, it's not just my country, I assure you. It's, uh, this, this kind of bread has, has spread. Um, so first of all, Moritz, uh, I would like to try some of this German sourdough bread that you described. That sounds incredibly delicious. I would like you to send me some. I would actually not like you to send me some. I don't want people sending me things. <laughs> that could get uh, that could get kind of dangerous. Um, but in spirit, I would like you to to send me things. Um, secondly, what you say is not surprising to me at all. That bread, that sourdough in Germany, doesn't go moldy very fast. This does not surprise me at all because you are discussing sourdough. Sourdough bread does not mold as fast as other bread because it is sour and acid is antifungal. That's why the makers of processed white sandwich bread popular in the United States and in other countries, that's why the makers of those breads add a small amount of vinegar to the dough as a preservative. Let us remind ourselves what exactly sourdough is. Sourdough is bread leavened with a starter. A starter is flour and water that you let sit for many days until the yeast that are naturally present in all flour and in all environments, those yeast can multiply all on their own and colonize that starter so thoroughly that a little bit of that starter can be used to ferment a whole other dough. The thing about starters is the yeast are not alone. You let that starter sit around, other microorganisms are going to be present, and they too are going to be able to be fruitful and multiply in that nutrient-rich environment you've provided them. In fact, you are depending on some other microorganisms to colonize your starter because you need the good-tasting ones to outcompete the bad-tasting and potentially dangerous ones that are also going to be coming around. So, in a good starter... You will not only have a lot of yeast, you will also have a lot of lactic acid producing bacteria, lactobacillus. If you get a good culture of those bacteria going in your starter, they will outcompete all of the bad bacteria that could come along, and they will prevent the growth of mold and other disgusting and potentially harmful fungi because they make lactic acid. That's their whole thing. And acid is antifungal. When you bake the bread, the bacteria die, as all things must, in a hot oven. But the acid remains, which is why sourdough tastes sour. 
Not all sourdough tastes very sour. There are many baking techniques you can use to minimize the sour taste, but all sourdough bread is going to be a little bit sour unless you neutralize it with baking soda or something, but that would be silly. And regardless, a little bit of acidity in there tastes nice, and it's going to cause the bread to resist molding in much the same way that white sandwich loaves are going to resist molding thanks to vinegar and other preservatives that are in it. White sandwich loaves, like the ones described in the video that I did earlier about white sandwich loaves, those only mold in three to five days, as we said in the video, if there's no preservatives in it, right? Including vinegar, which is a preservative in that context. I imagine that really sour sourdough will resist molding for even longer. So what you describe, Moritz, does not surprise me at all. Sourdough is probably the original bread leavener, but it is not the most popular anymore. Most yeast bread in this world is now baked with pure yeast grown for this purpose, baker's yeast. And before baker's yeast was widely available, bakers often used brewer's yeast, the yeast that is left over from brewing beer. If you make bread from brewer's yeast or from baker's yeast, you can get a loaf that is not sour at all. And consumers manifestly prefer that. Sourdough is globally less popular. But I, I love sourdough, love it, really sourdough, really, really sour sourdough is what I like, Re really all sourdough, it's all real good. And one of the many things that I love about sourdough is that it keeps a lot longer because it is sour and acid is antifungal. Now, staling, of course, is a totally different kind of spoilage. Staling is when the starch in bread gradually recrystallizes through a process called retrogradation. This results in the bread getting harder the older that it gets. Now, simultaneously, bread will dry out as it ages, especially if you don't seal it up in a bread box or in a bag or something. Drying also makes the bread harder. And since staling and drying happen at the same time and have a very similar practical effect of making the bread harder, it is often difficult to tell staling from drying in practice. So in that video that I did about white sandwich bread and bread preservatives and all of that, I talked about a crusty traditional loaf of bread that I baked with just white wheat flour, water, salt, baker's yeast, that's it. And I showed how it was hard the very next day. Something that I should have made more clear in that video is that I left that bread out on the counter overnight, uncovered, cut and uncovered. And I didn't put my cut side down on the board like you so uh, cleverly do with your bread. So not only do we get some amount of retrogradation overnight, the starch recrystallizing, we also got some drying. And those forces combined resulted in bread that was too hard to eat one day after it was baked. Also, it was a crusty loaf, which meant that it was kind of dry and hard to begin with, right? Especially compared to a very moist white sandwich bread. Anyway, if you're using an airtight bread box or a plastic bag or something, your bread is going to stay soft for longer than a day, probably much longer. Additionally, the bread that you describe, Moritz, um, has lots of ingredients in it apart from white wheat flour. You said that there is rye. You said that there's sunflower seeds. I don't know if the wheat in it is whole grain wheat or just white wheat flour. Regardless, bread that is more than just white wheat endosperm could indeed stale much more slowly, in effect at least, simply because there's lots of other stuff to get between the starch molecules and disrupt their matrix and inhibit their recrystallization. Or if they don't do that, they, there may simply be enough other stuff in there that you just don't notice the recrystallized starch as much because there is proportionally less of it because there's other stuff in the bread. Rye flour, which you mentioned is in your bread, Moritz, uh, rye flour has proportionally more fiber in it than wheat flour does. 
Also, it has more uh, free sugar in it, and sugar is hygroscopic, meaning it holds on to water. Wheat germ and sunflower seeds, those contain lots of fat, and fat will make bread stay softer longer. Fat doesn't evaporate like water does. This is why processed white sandwich bread has lots of added sugar and fat in it. That keeps it softer for longer. It also has a fair bit of water in it because the bake that they do on it is at a relatively low internal temperature, again, to keep it moist and soft. Processed white sandwich breads in the United States, I mean, they last a long time before they get stale. Long time. And that's not just because of the preservatives. The problem, of course, is that all of that sugar and water is very hospitable to mold. And what Dr. Carkley was saying in that video that you mentioned earlier, Moritz, is that uh, such bread will mold in three to five days unless they put in preservatives, which they absolutely do. So it doesn't mold in three to five days. It molds in like three to five weeks. You don't need the same preservatives in your sourdough, Moritz, because the lactic acid from the sourdough starter is your preservative. That's a preservative. And it works. And it sounds like great bread. I would love to try it. Please don't send me any. Don't send me things. That could get crazy. The last thing I will say, uh, however, is that uh, it actually is possible, Moritz, that you are eating moldy bread without realizing it. It's possible that everyone is doing that because... Mold is virtually invisible in bread until it gets mature enough that it creates spores. The spores and the teeny tiny parts of the fungus that actually create the spores, those are the parts that look green or blue or some other really visible color. But molds are just like mushrooms in that most of their body is made up of these fine little white threads called mycelia. With mushrooms, those threads are running through the ground or running through the rotting tree or whatever substrate the mushroom is growing in. The mushroom that grows out of the substrate and that we cut off and eat, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Most of the organism is underground and it looks like fine white threads. Most of the bread mold is fine white threads running through the interior of the bread, which itself is also comprised of fine, light-colored threads, right? The gluten network in bread looks thready. So unless you're looking for it, it's real hard to spot mold in bread until it has gotten mature enough that it is producing spores. So usually, if you see spores on your bread, it's already been moldy for a little while. You just didn't notice it. And yet you live. Some people have acute reactions to certain molds, but mostly the concern about eating bread mold is that um, mysotoxins could build up in your body over time, and you could have some kind of chronic health problem as a result. But basically, nobody knows if that's a thing that actually happens on any kind of meaningful scale. I have a whole video coming up about this topic, about bread mold and how dangerous it is, but short version is nobody knows if eating a little bit of bread mold every now and then is going to present any kind of chronic health risk in practice. Some people certainly have like allergic reactions, acute reactions, and they get acutely sick when they ingest certain molds or when they breathe in the spores, but that's a different thing. We'll do that video soon. Hey, all this talk about uh, soft, fluffy bread has got me thinking about my mattress from Helix Sleep, the sponsor of this video. My job involves a catastrophic amount of sitting and staring at a computer, and this does terrible things to my sleep and to my back, and my Helix mattress helps. 
I have the Dusk, which is a hybrid spring and foam mattress. I got that one because I went to Helix's website and I took their sleep quiz. They have recently updated that quiz and made it even better, even more detailed. You tell them about your size and shape and the size and shape of anyone you sleep with regularly. You tell them how you like to sleep, what problems you have in your sleep, whether you tend to get really hot when you sleep, that kind of thing. And Helix will recommend a mattress just for you. They've got mattresses for plus size sleepers, everybody. And the best part is the mattress comes in the mail in a box rolled up under vacuum compression. It ships for free in the United States. You just drag the box into the bedroom, you break the seal on the packaging, and the mattress inflates. That does not mean that it's an air mattress. It is not an air mattress. It is a real mattress, a very high-quality premium mattress that you do not need movers to get into your room. You can sleep on it for free for 100 nights, risk-free. If you don't like it, they'll come and take it back. There's a 10-year warranty, financing and payment plans available. Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for my listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash ragusia for up to 200 bucks off your Helix. Helixsleep.com slash ragusia. That URL is in the show notes. And I thank you, Helix. Hi, Adam. This is Kendall Darvo from Fargo, North Dakota. I have a stepdaughter who is a notoriously picky eater. And I'm wondering... What are some good ways to make a picky eater more willing to try other foods that may not be within their comfort zone? Let me know what you think. Thanks. Bye. So, Kendall, um, unlike many other things that we deal with here in the home kitchen, there actually is a fair bit of scholarly research on the topic of picky eating. And I have been working on a video about that for a long time kind of in the background. I will finish it at some point. It's just a tricky thing to do. It'll happen eventually. Uh, Nearly all of that research is on children. So in responding to your question now, I will talk about children at first, but I will get to adults. Anyway, picky eating or uh, food neophobia is the scientific term for it. This is actually an adaptation that we have evolved for very good reasons. When children are babies, they are almost never picky eaters. When they're babies, they swallow whatever you put in their mouth as long as they can swallow it. Then, as they approach the age of two, basically all children become picky eaters, at least for a little while. And this makes all the sense in the world. When you graduate from being a baby to being a toddler, you suddenly have the ability to walk around and find things on the ground and pick them up and jam them in your face. And when you're just a little baby, you you can't do that quite as effectively. You are fully dependent on an adult to feed you, and therefore you can rely on that adult's tastes to discern what is good food and what is poison. But once you get old enough that you can wander around and forage for yourself a little, then you got to rely on yourself to tell food from poison. And so we have evolved to suddenly get real nervous about new food once we transition into toddlerhood. This makes us less likely to eat something that will make us sick. We are evolved to like familiar foods because if the food is familiar, That means we've eaten it before, and it ain't killed us yet. So it's probably not acutely toxic if it's familiar. God knows what that food is doing to us over time, but if a food is acutely toxic, you probably won't live long enough to become familiar with it. Anyway, kids tend to start getting less picky around the age of four or five. At that point, you've hopefully gotten smart enough that you don't need this ultra-restrictive filter on your appetite anymore. Someone has told you to never eat the berries from that bush over there unless you want to die. Or someone has told you don't eat that mushroom unless you want to trip balls. Shouldn't be tripping balls when you're five. Maybe never. Anyways, but some people don't seem to grow out of that ultra-restrictive appetite filter that evolution has placed on their eating. 
Or if they do grow out of it, it just takes a lot longer than it takes for other people. Maybe years, maybe decades. My wife, Lauren, was a pretty picky eater until her like late 20s. And was that just a behavioral adaptation on her part? She just sort of committed to broadening her palate, and she did? Or did something change that was neurological in her brain? The brain does not finish developing until your mid to late 20s. Side note. Every teenage and 20-something who may be listening, please take heart in this knowledge that your brain keeps developing until your mid to late 20s. Your body might stop growing you know, vertically between the ages of 18 and 20, but your brain is still going. You don't have an adult brain until your mid 20s, which is why car rental companies used to refuse to rent to anyone under 25, and they probably still should. I remember being in my early 20s and feeling completely crazy. Crazy with intense emotion, crazy with barely controllable animal impulses. And then I remember hitting 26, 27 years old and feeling like, oh, thank God. (laughs) It was like waking up from a fever. Like waking up and being like, oh my God, how long was I out? What did I say? Oh, don't tell me. I don't want to know. Anyways, uh, it seems totally possible to me that a person's eating habits might change through their 20s because their brain is still changing a lot through their 20s. So maybe the answer to your question, Kendall, is uh, just wait for this picky eater in your life to grow up a little more, if that's still possible. I'm kind of spitballing here because almost all of the research on picky eating concerns young children because that's who we're most worried about, right? And if there is one clear takeaway from the studies that I have read, which is most of them, the clear takeaway is we actually shouldn't be too worried about it. The research shows little to no correlation between picky eating and differences in physical development, height, weight, health, any of that. Though these studies, like nearly all studies, were done in the developed world, where if a kid doesn't like one food, there is another food available that that kid might like instead. And even if it's just carbs, those carbs have probably been fortified with essential micronutrients. I have one kid who is a super picky eater, and I've got one kid who's a kind of picky eater, and they're both very healthy. Their blood work is all great. They're getting all their vitamins. Old timers, like uh, my boomer New York Italian father, they are fond of saying that uh, "Ah, we didn't have all these picky eaters back in my day. We only had one pot of food to eat on the whole block and you either ate it or you went to bed hungry. So you ate it. I am aware of no research documenting the rate of food neophobia or picky eating over the decades. I don't know how you could research rates of that as they changed over the decades. It might not be possible. It seems perfectly reasonable to hypothesize that people are less picky in times and places where food options are less abundant, right? Maybe you don't really want to try that new food, but it's the only food around, and hunger, true hunger, is a great motivator. At the same time, Perhaps there were super picky eater children back in the day, pathologically picky eating children back in the day, and people simply labeled them as being sickly and weak and they died because there was no food around that the kid would eat or the food that the kid would eat simply did not provide all of the essential nutrients and the kid got berry berry or something and died. I don't know. Maybe that happened, but I don't know. I don't think anybody knows, but the available research on children shows one thing pretty clearly too, which is that pressure, uh, negative pressure to you know eat that or you're going to go to bed early, uh, negative pressure is not very effective with children. Maybe it would be different for adults, but I kind of doubt it. I think picky eating is one of these new diseases of abundance, disorders that are unique to the post-scarcity world. 
And as a result, it is a very new problem and people are still figuring out how to treat it or how to consider it or whether it even should be considered a problem, a pathology. For example, whenever I talk about weight management, I try to couch the conversation in terms of my own personal goals for my own body composition and your personal goals in terms of your own body composition, because it's not really clear how much body fat is actually bad for your health. Certainly there's a point at which body fat percentage becomes too high for your health, but there is much scientific dispute about where exactly that point is. And therefore, we need to think critically about which body fat percentages we pathologize. Furthermore, we have to weigh the health benefits of encouraging people to lose weight. We have to weigh that against the harm that we do to people by making them neurotic about their weight. There's reason to believe that Psychological harm manifests as physical harm, both in terms of obvious things like stress responses in the body and less obvious things like people are scared to go to the doctor because they know they're going to get weighed and they're going to get yelled at for being fat. And so they don't go to the doctor and that cancer that they have never gets caught early enough because they were skipping their annual physicals because they didn't want to get yelled at about their weight. Anyway, <laughs> We are probably going to need to develop similarly nuanced thinking as it applies to picky eating, which is perhaps another disease of abundance. I mean, I'm sure people always did it, but maybe it happens a lot more often nowadays that we have the option to be picky. Do the benefits of pushing someone to eat more foods outweigh the potential harms? As it applies to children, the answer seems to be no going by the available research. Don't push them. Doesn't work. But grown-ups, of course, have more agency, and you or someone you love may be a grown-up who sincerely wants to eat more and different foods. And for such adults, I have little advice other than to keep growing up if your brain is still cooking. Maybe seek mental health services. This could easily all be part of a broader anxiety disorder that you need to address with a professional, and mental health providers have lots of tools for treating anxiety of all kinds. This seems to me to be a kind of anxiety, most likely. Also, um, if you want to lose weight for whatever reason, restricting your calories might actually be a way to kill two birds with one stone here. <laughs> um, Hunger really is the best sauce in the whole world, as uh, Miguel de Cervantes wrote in the 17th century, the Don Quixote guy. That's where that quote is from, hunger is the best sauce. Unfamiliar foods might seem a lot more appealing to you when you are hungry and when you have fewer options. And keeping fewer options in the house is a great way to help you restrict your calories. And restricting your calories is going to make you hungry, which is going to make all foods taste better, including unfamiliar ones. Maybe that could be a virtuous cycle. I don't know. That's all I got. I'm no expert. If you want to learn from experts, consider patronizing Skillshare, sponsor of this episode. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of online classes taught and taken by members across 150 countries. And it's a place where I have personally turned for expertise when I need to acquire a new skill, which is often. Devotees know that I am a pod person who was thrust by circumstances into a career as a video producer, despite not knowing a damn thing about cameras or lights or editing at the time. And some would say I still don't. For every video production skill I have needed to rapidly assimilate, there is a Skillshare class telling me what I need to know in just a few concise lessons, logically arranged with no ads. There's no reason for me to fish around aimlessly on the internet for that kind of information. Skillshare instructors have done all of that work for me. You just sit back, you hit play, Maybe do a little homework assignment that the instructor gives you. Maybe upload that to the Skillshare community to get some feedback. And these classes certainly do not just cover photo and video and film production, right? There's classes on illustration, animation, design, writing, 
business skills that could help you pivot to a new career or maybe grow in the career that you already have, or maybe just enjoy your hobbies a little bit more. One of the most popular Skillshare classes right now is about indoor gardening with Etka Chaudhry, who is a scientist who just kind of fell into a gardening hobby that became a career. I will share with you step by step how to grow ornamental houseplants, how to grow tomatoes, how to grow herbs and microgreens. If you've ever tried to learn something with aimless web searching or with expensive formal education, you know the drawbacks with both of those. Skillshare is the alternative. It is so inexpensive. And the first thousand of you who use my link in the show notes, you'll get a one month free trial of Skillshare. Try it for a month free with my link in the episode description. You could instead just use my code, which is adamragusia0522. Do that at checkout, adamragusia0522, and you can also get that one month free trial. Thank you, Skillshare, for uh, supporting the new Adam Ragusia pod. Hey, Adam. Uh, my name is Nick, and I got a question from one Italian-American to another. Uh, of our people, there are two varieties those who eat tomato gravy, and those who eat tomato sauce. What do you call that thing in which you stew meatballs, sazik, um, ribs, bracciole, etc.? Making me hungry there, Nick. Um, keep in mind, Nick, that I am only one half New York Italian American. My other half is is a whole nest worth of wasps. Uh, For people beyond the United States, wasp in this context stands for white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Anglo-Saxon in this context meaning people of English origin who may or may not actually be of Anglo-Saxon origin because it's questionable whether the Anglo-Saxon settlement of Britain was actually a replacement of the indigenous Romano-British population or merely a replacement of their language and culture. But anyways... First wave of European settlement in what is now the northern United States was Protestants from England. Therefore, Protestants of English descent held the political power when later waves of Europeans arrived on these shores, and this resulted in some level of antagonism, particularly with the uh, much later Italian immigrants who were Catholic. They were Catholic, and they were poor, and they were loud, and outwardly emotional, and they were therefore the polar opposite of the wasps, who were quiet, rich, emotionally uncommunicative and unavailable, etc., etc. It's the Protestant way, and the English way. Anyway, uh, I am a wasp on my mom's side. I got some German in there, too. And because... Of that side of my family, I believe, Nick, that gravy is canned stock thickened with way too much starch until it resembles an opaque meat jello. That's what gravy is to me because of my wasp side. Tomato sauce, I call tomato sauce, not gravy. Honestly, the weird thing about tomato sauce on my Italian side is how ungravy like it was. And by ungravy, like, I mean it was thin. Grandma Ragusia's tomato sauce was really, really thin, like downright watery. And my dad's sauce is thicker, but it's still thinner than how I make it. Quick tangent. Why is tomato sauce thick? I'm pretty sure that it's mostly just fiber. Soluble and insoluble fiber in the tomato that gets broken down into a paste and then concentrated as you cook the tomato sauce and you evaporate off the water. What's left is a heap of fibers. But uh, somebody on the internet recently challenged me on that assumption. They argued that pectin in the tomato is at least partially responsible for the thickening of the tomato sauce. Pectin, of course, is a polysaccharide that is found in the cell walls of, I think, all plants, but it is particularly abundant in fruits, and tomatoes are fruits, they're berries. Pectin is used to thicken and set jams and jellies and such. Now, pectin is a kind of fiber. 
Pectin is dietary fiber in humans. So the pectin claim is really not at all at odds with my claim that tomato sauce is thickened with fiber. But I still don't think that pectin plays much of a role in thickening tomato sauce because pectin breaks down with heat. This is why jam and jelly recipes warn you against boiling beyond the gel point for longer than a few minutes. The pectin breaks down and then your jelly doesn't set. Tomato sauce is generally cooked for a really long time. So my guess is the pectin mostly breaks down, but you know, I could be wrong. Chemistry is weird. If any actual scientists have thoughts on this, let me know. AskAdamQuestions at gmail.com. AskAdamQuestions at gmail.com. Time now for failure of the week. This is the time in the show when I tell you about how I have failed lately. I have failed to launch a successful podcast. I have succeeded at launching a somewhat successful video podcast, if you can call that a podcast, but I have failed at launching a successful podcast podcast. I mean, many thousands of people are listening to this podcast via a podcast app right now. And I am very thankful for that and appreciative. Lots of people grind for years and years and years to develop an audience the size of the one that I have via the podcast apps right now. I'm very happy. But the majority of the people consuming this program right now are doing so on YouTube. I have failed to convert video audience over into pod audience. I anticipated this possibility. You'll recall that the first episode a few weeks ago was called Doomed to Failure. YouTube people and pod people are different kinds of people. I don't want to force anyone to become someone that they are not. Only bad things happen when you try to be someone you're not, and when you try to make somebody else be someone that they aren't for your benefit. And I suppose that as much as I want to be a podcaster, because I love pod, I came from pod, I am a professional YouTuber, manifestly. Which is why my voice sounds a little bit different today. I am recording this in my kitchen rather than in my pod corner that I foamed out down in the basement. If a majority of people are going to watch this show on video, I probably need to find some ways to make it look a little bit nicer. So I'm shooting in a slightly more attractive location right now that is also more reverberant, which is why I sound a little different. We'll see if this works out. This is all an experiment. We'll see what happens. I thank you for being flexible and for going on this journey with me. Okay, next question. Hey, Adam. Uh, My name is Elena. I am a biology teacher. Uh, My question is for cats or for any living thing, really. Uh, So I have two cats and they love to eat the cooking oil (laughs) from my foods. So my question is, is it safe to let them do so or should I be stopping them and immediately clean my kitchen right after cooking dinner? That's my question. Thank you. I have quickly consulted the uh, same online veterinary resources that you have probably already consulted, Elena, and uh, the clear consensus is, A, your cats are not weird. This is a thing that cats and dogs do. And B, it's probably not the best thing that you can feed your animals, but it's probably not the worst either. Too much fat in your cat's diet will cause diarrhea and potentially vomiting for the same exact reason that too much fat will do that to you and me. Your body can only make so much of the enzymes that it needs to break down fats into digestible free fatty acids. And if you can't break them down, you're going to pass them and that's going to be unpleasant. The current hysteria surrounding uh, industrial seed oils is probably as stupid as it pertains to pets as it pertains to humans, which is to say it's not totally stupid. Highly refined sources of pure calories are probably bad for us if we eat too much of them, which most of us do. But there's nothing like toxic about canola oil. Probably not. Humans and other animals can gradually get... uh, Liver problems from eating way too much fat. That's a thing that could happen to cats and dogs. I suppose there is one added potential hazard here for the pets, which is that 
your dirty dishes are likely to contain other things beyond the oil. And there are foods commonly eaten by humans that can be real bad for pets. Everybody knows about chocolate and dogs and cats. That's not a myth. That's a real thing, though they would have to eat a lot of chocolate to get really sick. Uh, the culprit compound is a, uh, it's a bitter alkaloid called theobromine. That's the thing in chocolate that uh, poisons cats and dogs. And it's only in actual chocolate. Most chocolate products contain surprisingly little actual chocolate from cacao beans, um, especially chocolate here in the United States. So uh, pets generally have to eat a lot of chocolate before they get sick. They might get sick from the excess fat before they get sick from the uh, theobromine. But uh, you're probably not pan frying your chocolate, <laughs> Elena. You are, however, probably uh, frying your alliums, your garlic, and your onions. And alliums, you probably know, are really toxic to cats and dogs, both acutely in large doses and chronically in small doses. Allium toxicosis, it's called, uh, happens when allicin and related special tasty things in alliums, uh, they, apparently what they do is they cause the transformation of hemoglobin in these animals into methemoglobin, and the result is a kind of anemia in lots of animal species, not just cats and dogs. And apparently some breeds of cats and dogs are more sensitive to this than others. So that's another thing that would give me pause about letting the cats lick the pans too much. There could be a lot of allium left in there, enough to make them sick. Though, you know, if you do this and you take your cats to the vet and they're fine, like, who cares? You know, nobody lives forever. So live a little. Right? Dearest Adam, this is George. Now tell us, Adam Ragusia, what are your thoughts on the situation in Ukraine? And, more importantly, what is your opinion on gastro sanctions? For example, renaming foods, like when French fries cringingly became freedom fries, or boycotting Russian restaurants, etc. Thank you. Okay. My thoughts on the situation in Ukraine? Since you asked, and only since you asked, my thoughts on the situation in Ukraine are that I am horrified and I am much more scared now than I was at the outset. And I was pretty scared at the outset. Yes, it's awesome that Kiev is not directly under siege anymore, but I am scared about the more uh, long-term problems that could be next on the war schedule, such as famine caused by Russia's blockade of Ukrainian ports and by Russia's thieving of grain and the destruction of civilian infrastructure needed to get people food. And I am really scared about escalation and Putin doing really scary, stupid shit because he feels he has no other way to get out of this mess that he's made with his power and dignity intact. The world has gotten insufficiently terrified of nuclear war. We should all be much more scared of how much worse this could get, not just for the people currently directly involved, but for all of us. I think that Putin and Putin's Russia, that's the primary asshole in this whole very sad story. But there is probably some other blame to go around. I'm not sure if the United States and its allies needlessly provoked Putin and provided him with some pretext for his invasion. But I am sure that the United States ceded its moral authority by embarking on its own invasions and wars of choice in recent years. And that moral authority would really come in handy about right now, wouldn't it? I continue to hope for a diplomatic resolution I think that the West probably needs to give Putin some kind of way out, some way that he can declare some kind of victory and save some face and end this thing. A diplomatic solution that involves some ceding of territory might seem awful, but I feel very secure in my position that almost anything is better than war. 
and literally anything is better than nuclear war. On the other hand, that's easy for me to say, given that I'm not a person whose territory may be ceded. On the mutant third hand, I think that we in the West, in our admirable solidarity with Ukraine, we have also uh, willfully ignored some of the complexities of the longstanding situation in Ukraine's East, which I do not claim to understand, but I think the conflict between Ukraine's central authority and Russia-backed separatists in the East, I think that that longstanding conflict is probably more morally complex than Russia just trying to steamroll tanks into Kiev and take over the whole country, which was insane and morally not complex. It was immoral, categorically. But the situation in the East, I'm not quite as sure about. And if we in the global West are going to keep arming Ukraine in a war that shifts almost totally into one that's over control of Donbass in the East— I think that we are going to have to reckon with the complexities there more than we have in our public political discourse up to this point. No matter what those complexities may be, I still think that Putin has become a monster, and I understand why nobody wants to negotiate with him or give him any kind of win. Then again, as has been observed many times before, you don't make peace with your friends. To your question about uh, gastro sanctions, George, let us first stipulate that uh, this is not really an important thing. You know that, George. It's just the topic that I'm actually kind of qualified to address, (laughs) as opposed to everything I've discussed up to this point about Ukraine. Not really qualified to have opinions on any of that. Let's talk about gastro sanctions. (laughs) For the young kids listening at home who uh, might not know about the whole Freedom Fries episode that George mentioned, in 2003, the United States invaded Iraq to depose the government there, and the French were uh, notably opposed to this American action. So in retaliation to their opposition, in retaliation, the U.S. Congress removed French fries from the menus of congressional cafeterias and replaced them with freedom fries, which were, of course, the same thing. Freedom is this weird MacGuffin in United States political discourse. We have a story here that we tell ourselves, that we are the freest people in the world, or perhaps even that we are the only free people in the world. It's the only free country. This is a belief that was never accurate, But it has gotten even less accurate in the decades since it first took hold in our national psyche. Plenty of countries are just as free as the United States is, arguably more so. The situation is further complicated by the fact that people can't really agree as to what freedom really is. There is a notable dispute on that subject happening right now in the United States regarding the legal status of abortion. Whose freedom are we protecting? And whose definition of freedom are we applying? So basically, whenever people want to make unstudied arguments against things they don't like here in the United States, they tend to accuse those things or the people advancing them of being threats to freedom. You're not supporting our invasion of Iraq, France? Well, we're going to characterize your lack of support for our invasion as an affront to our freedom. So we're going to liberate ourselves from you by calling the French fries freedom fries. It was as dumb as it sounds, not least because the United States inherited this dumb worship of a facile concept of freedom from whom? From the French! Liberté! Or at least uh, the United States and France developed this facile concept of freedom as a transatlantic co-venture. We did it together. So uh, your implicit question for me, George, is should people in the West right now try to punish Russia for its war and its war crimes 
by not cooking Russian food or by giving it a different name if we do? Well, I think the world has more reason to be mad at Russia right now than the United States had to be mad at France in 2003, that's for sure. I have been tinkering around on a video about copper lately, copper pans, copper cups. Copper has some unique chemical and heat transfer properties in the culinary world, and I was thinking the other day about how when I do this video about copper, I'm going to need to make a Moscow mule in the traditional copper cup that it comes in. And I actually thought to myself, should I do that right now? Like at this moment in history, should I make a Moscow mule on the internet right now? Or should I do it and call it a Mariupol mule or a Manhattan mule, given that Manhattan is probably where the drink in question was actually invented, not Moscow. I'm not saying this is an important thing to worry about. I'm just saying it's a thing that I recently worried about. I suppose I think that sanctions of all kinds are good or could be good in the short term. Could be good in the short term if they really do influence behavior. But I think that they're likely to be bad in the long term. I think that integration and engagement and openness have a pretty good track record when it comes to the causes of peace and progress. Isolating nations in the long term seems to backfire more often than not. And I'm hardly an expert on international relations, but I'm also hardly the first person to observe that. So I want Russia to feel the heat right now. I want the people of Russia to know how deeply people like me disapprove of what their government is doing. I don't want to be a party to what the Russian government is doing, that's for sure. And if there's a chance that an all-inclusive Western boycott of everything Russia might influence Russia's collective behavior right now to de-escalate, then I think that's worth doing. The boycott is worth doing if that pressure makes Russia less excited to prosecute this war. And that's a big if. But long-term, I think that uh, even nations with huge, sincere, legitimate differences— Those nations still have to live and work together, as we have generally done, with some notable historical exceptions. And I doubt that the causes of peace and progress would be well served by a long-term cultural boycott of Russia, or in this case, a boycott of a non-Russian thing that happens to be named after the capital of Russia. Love a Moscow mule. So good. I am actually quite enamored of Russian culture and history. I've studied it since college. And I am very sad to see Russia come to this point. I am very sad to see Russia's government throw away the lives of its own soldiers in such an unnecessary and unjustified mission, and to do it with such incompetence and such reckless disregard for anyone's lives. It is mind-boggling. And if the West needs to swallow a shit sandwich to give Putin some kind of meager victory and therefore give him an excuse to end this abomination that he clearly was not prepared for, then I think that's worth considering. Says the internet cook, who won't be one of the people who actually has to personally eat the shit sandwich. But I appreciate all of you for eating the shit sandwich that was this episode of the Adam Ragusea pod. You can email me a question to answer, askadamquestions at gmail. Please send a video file, preferably, or an audio file if you're more comfortable with that. Introduce yourself and state your question succinctly, which people did this week. Very pleased by that. Ask me about anything you want, not just food. Ask me questions about yourself, not just questions about me. Do me a favor and type up a quick summary of your question and put it in the email subject or in the body that'll help me find it. Ask Adam questions at Gmail. I still have a lot of great questions in the email box that I, and I will get to some of them before I move on to new questions. As long as uh, you keep listening. Thank you for doing so. Talk to you next time.